Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of uh, TDS uh, members and uh, other organizations uh, joining us uh, today uh, in Timber Design uh, Society's eighth uh, webinar of series 2022. My name is Namir Amsu, member of the TDS Management Committee. This webinar is kindly sponsored by the following organizations, TDS Committee, expresses its thanks and appreciation for their uh, sponsor, for their sponsorship uh, to fund their activities. Exlam, Simpson, Strong Tie, MyTech, and Future Build LVL. Today's, <clears throat> excuse me, today's webinar is presented by Robert Finch of Timber Design Center about the timber design center and why the timber is right for this initiative. Robert Finch is the director of the new formed timber design center, which is collaboration between New Zealand Timber Design Society, wood processing, and Manufacturers Association, Brands, and Sion. The center is hosted at Sion and is financially supported for establishing, for, for establishment throughout the Ministry of uh, Primary Industries in New Zealand. Forthcoming webinars. As we mentioned last webinar, uh, TDS had secured <coughs> uh, October and November. Uh, 13th of October, we will have uh, the seismic performance and durability of uh, timber uh, based structural insulation panels, the SIPs by David Carradine. And on the 24th of November, we have a talk by Daniel Schadmeyer talking on designing mid-rise and MDH to NZS3604 or NZS3603. We will confirm the last one on 8th uh, December very soon. Okay, now, <clears throat> please, as Benedict said, please post your brief and short questions, not too long, uh, in the questions and answers uh, box. Uh, my colleague, Daniel Morader, TDS uh, president, will take care of the questions and answers. Thank you very much once again, and look forward to see you on the 13th of October. And uh, please allow me to welcome Robert Finch. Passing to you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Namir, um, for that introduction. Much appreciated. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start, I would just like to um, thank the Timber Design Society for the opportunity to talk to you today, this afternoon, for a brief period. Um, it's greatly appreciated um, since it's uh, an opportunity to just um, make it a little more widely known that um, the Timber Design Centre uh, has commenced and um, is, is uh, just starting to um, establish itself. So thank you for the opportunity. So I've have a short presentation, um, people that I want to um, put to you today. I've entitled it The Time is Right, and I think it'll become obvious to you as I step through with this, um, why I've called it that. Um, what I would like to do is just introduce you to the Timber Design Centre, um, provide you with some background uh, as, as to how and why the Timber Design Centre came about and what, what the case 
for such a centre was and the drivers behind that, um, uh, an indication of what our short-term aspirations um, are and a, a quick snapshot of what things that we've done so far in the couple of months that we've uh, been in existence so far. So I will just move ahead now. So perhaps just reiterating um, what Namir said in his introduction, um, the Timber Design Centre is actually um, supported and underpinned by a collaboration between Brands and Scion, uh, the Timber Design Society and the Wood Processors and Manufacturers Association. Um, and because it is at the moment, it's brand new, it is not a legal entity in its own right. Um, it's kindly hosted um, at Scion, uh, by Scion, um, and its funding and underpinning support through financially um, comes directly through Tauru Raku, uh, which is um, the New Zealand Forestry Service uh, section of MPI, Ministry for Primary Industries. So they are the, the supporting part of partners who've got together to bring this about. So perhaps a, a useful question to, to just think about and address to begin with is a um, very simple one, why, why have a timber design centre? Um, and I think the easiest uh, answer to that, or the simplest answer I can give you that uh, to that is, I guess it's when you cut everything else away, uh, its primary purpose is to assist the greater application of timber uh, into the built environment. And there's a whole lot of reasons why we, we would want to do that. And hopefully some of those at least will become clear um, as I step through a few slides with you. Before we do that, um, just a couple of slides um, on a little bit of relevant background. Um, and here you can see I've got some background in relation to forest and wood products. Um, these are all relevant, I think, to uh, the case for the Timber Design Centre. Uh, New Zealand uh, forests um, uh, actually constitute New Zealand's largest renewable resource, um, bar none. And the forestry and wood processing sector contributed um, a pretty substantial $6.7 billion to the New Zealand economy in 2021. Um, the sector itself in, uh, employed uh, in excess of 35,000 people um, in 2021, and um, the global demand for wood fibre is actually forecast to quadruple by 2050. Um, so you can see being such an important resource for this country, uh, it actually makes sense that New Zealand should try and capitalise on this in, in perhaps in a way that it hasn't done um, as well as it could uh, in, in the past. And others are thinking that way and the industry transformation plan, um, which I'll talk a bit, little bit about in a moment, um, obviously is based around that uh, premise as well. Uh, a little bit of background in relation to the building and construction sector or industry. Uh, timber has uh, already has uh, an in excess of 90% market share in the single household residential building market in, in New Zealand. Um, that's the single, single dwelling. Um, but timber's share of, of what we call multi-residential and commercial, industrial and health and aged care building sectors is actually incredibly low, uh, which is in common with some other countries around the world, but um, you can see already uh, where opportunity lies. Uh, the construction sector, uh, in 2021 was responsible for about 15% of New Zealand's annual greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is in a New Zealand context is, is significant. Um, and the building and construction sector emissions actually increased um, over the past 10 years by, um, by just over 66%. Um, and in recent times, the Climate Change Commission um, actually recommended that timber could displace more emissions intensive materials in the building sector. And this would be a helpful, helpful thing um, in the long term. And in 2021, um, uh, approximately 40% of all new builds in New Zealand were actually multi-residential um, buildings, so multi-storey apartments and 
units and so on. So larger structures, not, not single household structures. So you can see um, putting those things together, there, there is an opportunity for the sector to make a, what I would call it a transformative change. I guess I summarize all the things that I see happening, not just in New Zealand, but, but on a global scale as well, um, that you could say we're all part of the rationale as to why the Timber Design Centre was formed. Uh, and I just call them the mega trends. Um, the first one really is government emissions targets and recent policies and positions and statements. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, the second is global trends. The very fact that there are actually quite a lot of governments around the world now thinking in a very similar way uh, recognising that um, the climate change uh, phenomena uh, and the impacts it is already causing and definitely going to cause in the future is something that needs to be not only taken seriously, but we actually need to get serious about taking mitigation steps. So there's there's a global influencing effect. Um, the fact that we we actually, you know, compared to some time ago, we have new timber technologies at our fingertips that we can do things with. We, you know, the things like CLT, um, LVL, glue lamb, and, and so on, and other technologies as well. Um, so there's an opportunity, uh, not only on the, the forestry resource base in this country, but there's an opportunity presented by virtue of the fact that we have new things that we can do bigger and better things with. And then the fourth one there um, is the industry transformation plan which has been drafted and published in draft form uh, by MPI on the 19th of August um, and I guess in its core it's it's really all about uh, identifying how New Zealand can um, capitalize on its forestry resources um, turn those resources into higher value products for the good of the country and ultimately to um, help the uh, greenhouse gas emission program uh, at the same time. So these, these are what I think of as the mega trends, which um, all play a part in the rationale for why the Timber Design Centre came about. If we just look a little more closely at the government policy and guidance um, items that, that have been more recent, um, you have the New Zealand gov government and ultimately New Zealand committing to achieving a net zero greenhouse gas emissions position by 2050. Um, the Building for Climate Change program has been established uh, through, MB through MB2 reduce emissions uh, in the building and construction sector quite specifically. Um, and I think as a result of these things, um, we can reasonably anticipate uh, there'll be future regulation uh, to, re to reduce the whole of life and body carbon, particularly uh, in, in the sector. And perhaps initially this will be through some form of mandatory reporting, um, perhaps at consenting stage, and then more, and subsequently um, this could uh, lead to the introduction of carbon caps for whole of life and body carbon. And, you know, in response to that thinking, um, the industry feedback um, created through MB to dates indicated that the largest obstacle um, to this sort of transformation was, um, uh, to, was uh, assessment and, and was, was an agreed methodology around assessment. Um, so that's something that we are, and the Timber Design Centre are, are very cognizant of also. I think three specific um, pieces of uh, or, or publications from the government before I leave this, this topic uh, would be these. Um, the first one that you see there was actually a publication just in May this year, just a couple of months ago. Um, and it's New Zealand's first emissions reduction plan. And the primary uh, aims, that's a very broad ranging plan. It's, a, it's across all sectors, essentially. Um, but if you pick the chapter in the area that is specifically on the build, related to the building and construction sector, 
Um, in essence, it, it's about reducing embodied carbon of buildings and reducing operational emissions. The second uh, is a publication then just in April this year uh, entitled The Procurement Guide to Reducing Carbon Emissions in Building and Construction. And really what it says and what its aims are, just distilled right down, I guess, uh, is that mandated agencies, that's mandated government agencies, uh, must adopt a three-step process for, for procurement. Um, I don't intend to go through what that three-step process is. I, we don't need to flesh that out today. Um, but in the end, uh, it's it really what it is it doing. It's aiming to identify the lowest possible carbon option um, that will meet the project requirements in hand. Uh, and the third would be the whole of life embodied carbon assessment uh, techni technical methodology, which was published just in February this year. Uh, and it provides a proposed method for ass assessing embodied carbon in, uh, in buildings in New Zealand. So I think these are, these are three, really three quite important drivers. So if we bring all of that together, um, I summarise that in what I call the case for the Timber Design Centre. And, and that, that includes um, the global trends uh, in response to, uh, you know, the, the obvious and clear need now to reduce um, CO2 emissions. Um, we're seeing the impacts of this all around the globe um, in an increasing way, um, seemingly month by month. Uh, New Zealand's response to the imperative to reduce the emissions and it's, it's now stated aim towards a, a circular economy. Um, the recognition that uh, the transformation, that transformative change is needed um, in the industry to meet future emission limits uh, that, will, that will come into, to, into play, I'm absolutely certain. Um, further recognition that um, most parts of the sector require assistance to do substantial transformation. And then uh, recognition that, that um, uh, change needs to happen in a way that is both economically viable uh, and which results in an improved um, long-term wellbeing for our communities. So um, all of that put together, I guess, um, is, is what um, you would say caused the response um, from those that uh, are close here thinking about it. And as such, then the Timber Design Centre was launched in, in March this year. Just another thing to, uh, I think, take a, a, a quick glimpse at. Um, the other question might be to say, well, because I mean, I ask, regularly ask myself this, you know, why is timber not commonplace? In, in the non-single residential dwelling market. Um, what is it that has prevented it um, in the past? Um, unfortunately, there, there is, I don't believe there's one simple, nice, straightforward answer to that. Um, it's actually come about as a result of many different things, um, obstacles and barriers, which can apply at different times to building, building different building initiatives. And I've just put some of them here, um, and I'm sure none of these are, um, are a surprise to you, but, you know, it includes things like um, dated or outdated and, in some cases, conflicting standards, um, lack of uh, experience on the part of many designers um, and specifiers, specifically in relation to designing with um, mass timber. Um, that's not dismissing those that are quite clearly um, have a lot of expertise in this area. Um, it's, a, it's more a statement about the broader common position um, and it, that understanding is not there in a broad sense, which ultimately we're going to need if, if we're going to make a massive change. There's, there's real and perceived consenting risks at different times. Um, there's real and, and perceived supply and availability of product uh, risks. Uh, lack of awareness generally of where do I go to find stuff? How do I get some design guidance on this? Who do I ask? Where is it? How do I find it? There's that sort of thing. Um, there's often poor feasibility costing at that early concept and feasibility stage. And I'll just touch on that in a moment in the next slide. Um, and there is, of course, things like perceived cost penalties um, for uh, specifiers and designers 
and in some cases some general um, sector resistance to change and and that's that's not unreasonable um, you know being different costs something it costs time it costs money and uh, if you uh, want to set about offering something that's slightly different to your client, then um, you pretty quickly recognise that there's a cost involved for you to do that. So I think this is just a, uh, a, in my simple compilation of some of the uh, myriad of reasons as to why timber really hasn't been commonplace. And, and that's mostly in contrast with the uh, the long-standing position of um, structural steel and reinforced concrete. So just quickly uh, point on that point of um, perceived cost penalties. Uh, I just, I won't spend too long on this. Um, it's just a page out of a, um, a report, which is a, a case study on the Clearwater Keys apartments, uh, which was done by the Mid-Rise Wood Construction Group. Um, and that full port report can actually be found on that website right there. Um, and this piece here is something done by the Logic Group, who were the um, QSs for that particular project. And I'm just specifically looking at this column here to begin with um, in relation to core structure and construction costs. For example, the mass timber one. So remember, this is at feasibility stage, very early stage. The mass timber ones identified it being... Um, about 2.7 million steel and concrete 2.2, concrete 2.5, and a timber steel hybrid 2.3. Uh, so on the basis of just let's just compare some element for element um, uh, structural elements in in the in the in the structure. Um, actually, timber looks pretty poor, um, and for that reason, and the, bearing in mind that the vast majority of QSs actually just don't have a whole lot of data. They have very little data in their substantial databases that can tell them in an early sense what the likely cost per square metre for a timber, for a mass timber option is. They have endless amounts of data in relation to reinforced concrete and structural steel, but not mass timber. Um, so if you just try and do that comparison with the contingencies that are often put on uh, for timber because of the unknowns, um, it never looks good. If you get a bit more um, uh, detailed about it and include PNG costs and so on, you can see that um, you end up with a position where timber actually looks uh, far more desirable as, as an option. So the pure mass timber one here in this case, in this example then comes out at 3.3 million versus 3.5 for steel concrete, um, 3.8 for the concrete and the lowest of all in this particular case was 2.9 for a hybrid timber steel building. So I guess the important message there is um, you, you need to do more than just compare the cost of material for material. You actually have to uh, get a bit more detailed and look quite carefully at the entire outturn cost for the project uh, before you can genuinely um, make a statement about whether a timber option is, is economically viable um, for a particular project or not. And that requires a bit more, and I think that's part of the problem. This, this same piece of software that Logic Group have been developing, the QS, uh, also does an instantaneous upfront uh, embodied carbon calculation and comparison for you, which is also very useful and I think will be very, very much useful in the future. Um, and it, um, of course, in this instance, shows that the, um, the pure timber one is by far the most desirable when it comes to sequestered carbon. So in recognition of all of this, um, what will or what might Timber Design Society, uh, sorry, Timber Design Centre, excuse the slip, um, do to help? And I guess this is just my quick summary of the things that I, I feel certain we will be attacking and, and in some cases are starting to. Um, it, it'll be important that we, as time goes on, that we better understand the challenges that the building owners, particularly and the developers and the financiers face when they're contemplating a new build, and in particular, um, if they are willing to look at a timber option, as I think will be put to them more and more in the future. Uh, we need to better understand the risks and the sources of resistance experienced by the designers and the specifiers, and the contractors, of course, and to, um, to what sort of things might we do in, in response to some of that better understanding is we will 
definitely be developing an online, and I'm just calling it a one-stop shop, um, for access to timber-related design guidance and data and case studies and information and so on, uh, including uh, supply chain directories and whatnot. So um, hopefully one place where um, as soon as you think uh, mass timber and you're thinking design and specification, um, you'll think to go to this and hopefully you'll find mostly what you're looking for to get the assistance. Um, we'll provide a technical service capability and a referral gateway. The exact nature of that and the exact scope of that is something that is very much in debate yet uh, internally and at governance level. Um, so I won't dwell on that. Um, it, I think it's an important thing, but exactly what's offered um, uh, is yet to be decided. Uh, we can assist and will assist with standards coordination and continuous improvement and updating of, of such documents. Uh, and in collaboration with others, provide some short-term training and workshops and seminars. Um, and that'll be primarily aimed at the designing, uh, design and consent authorities. Um, but of course we could, can and would in hopefully work hand in hand with the likes of Brands and Woodworks and others um, in that who, who are already doing good work in that space to be perfectly frank. Um, assist also with the implementation of parts of that MPI uh, in, industry transformation plan that I spoke about earlier. There are some bits in that plan which are very much um, uh, uh, something that I think the Tim Design Centre can help with when it comes to implementation of that plan. Uh, if you, by the way, if you haven't read it, um, I'd urge you to seek it out on the MPI website, download it, read it, and um, Beyond that, go one step further and actually provide some feedback to MPI um, from your perspective. Uh, there's a template that they provide there for you to provide feedback. It was published on the 19th of August and it's in a draft form just for um, consultation. Um, so yes, I'd, I'd certainly urge you to, to look to do that if you can find a little bit of time. Uh, we will support education and capability building in, in the processing and design and specification professions and um, uh, more longer term, but, but we'll start some of this before this establishment period is completed. Um, identify and implement some R&D um, that is deemed to be needed to address some longer term needs uh, when it comes to a pl uh, application of timber in the built environment. There's a number of things there which I think are perhaps higher priority than others, and we will scope and check the veracity of, of um, priority um, before we actually move in that direction. So a quick snapshot of the establishment timeline for the Timber Design Centre here, or a summary. It was launched in March 2022. Uh, we're now deep in the processes of um, developing the value proposition and the st strategy and the scope and the business model and so forth. Um, very, very soon, um, and over the next couple of months, we will be then shifting attention, this is internal stuff, to looking at what an enduring fund funding model might look like. Um, you know, a lot of you perhaps recognise that there have been other initiatives in the past, most certainly. Um, but for various reasons, they haven't endured. Um, and one of the critical um, desires with this new initiative is that actually this thing is enduring. Um, what, it, what is it that we have to do to um, shore up and make sure that it is enduring, both in a funding and operational sense? So we'll be looking at that very carefully. Um, identify, uh, which we've actually spent some time very recently, including today, um, Deliver, scoping and delivering some early industry wins, I guess you'd call it, what things might we be able to do very uh, quickly between now and the 30th of June that um, will actually be genuinely of assistance and, and usefulness um, to the industry, the designers and specifiers particularly. And if we once we've got through that, um, effectively we would regard that as being established, the centre as being established um, up by about the June, end of June, 2023. So what are actually are our aspirations for that establishment period? I'd summarize them like this way, um, that we've developed sound foundations for an enduring center, um, some sort of meaningful brand proposition and value proposition, um, a 
developed an online web portal for all things timber. Um, we will have commenced some form of a technical, technical service provision and directory capability. Um, we will have already, in fact, we've already become involved in assistance in some ways with uh, standards coordination and review. Um, we will have launched some effective communications and awareness raising uh, in various parts of the industry. And uh, quite importantly, re-establish the Timber Design Awards program, um, and then further identified and scoped some longer term research needs. So I think that captures probably the, the things that we aspire to achieve by the 30th of June, um, 2023, or the key things at least. So what, what have we done so far um, since the launch um, or the scorecard to date? Um, and they're listed here. The key, the key things at least are, um, we've established the uh, MPI funding path for um, establishing the centre. Uh, we've had the core parties um, agree over the, the terms and conditions of um, collaboration, and that's all signed and in place. We have um, a really good quality governance group with an independent chair formed and fully operational. Um, the centre director uh, and management assistants has been appointed. So that's myself and um, just literally two days ago, Deb Debbie Fergie. Um, so we're down the path of, of recruitment, but actually it is a very challenging area um, to, because the key thing that we're trying to do now is appoint some technically related technical people. But um, anyway, we might get back to that before I finish. Um, we've completed a stakeholder um, mapping exercise and we're well underway with strategy development, um, provided some early assistance in, uh, in relation to a couple of standards, uh, joint standards in particular, um, Australia New Zealand standards um, as a coordinating body. Um, I've actually been conducting quite a range of one-on-one -on -one, uh, industry engagements and meetings um, across this across the spectrum from forestry uh, through to manufacturing uh, through to design and specification uh, of buildings and structures um, and we've commenced some initial um, uh, print communications um, by way of editorial and a few magazines and, and so on just to um, as well as a, a holding online website which I haven't actually uh, put there um, so those things have all been done to just help um, uh, those communication things to help raise some initial awareness uh, as we try to get underway. So just very quickly now, um, the TDC governance group, just so that you're aware of who it is, it's chaired by Joe Davidson, um, the independent chair. Um, the representative from Scion is Doug Gaunt, who perhaps quite a few of you might know. Uh, Stephen McCauley, who's the comparatively new CEO at um, WPMA, that's the Wood Processors and Manufacturers Association, and Daniel Moroda, of course, who's the current uh, TDS president re representing TDS, and Chris Litton from Brands, and Kevin Hastings and uh, Jess Jessica Tremendanas can uh, the MPI observers um, who we have on the governance group since um, they are providing the underpinning uh, funding for this establishment period. So that gives you a sense of, um, of the governance leadership of, of, of the entity so far. Who else um, is working in, in the same area or, or seeking similar sorts of outcomes in general for um, uh, promoting and, and advocating for um, greater application of, of mass timber, let's call it, in the, in the built environment. Um, perhaps uh, the more obvious ones are the mid-rise wood construction, who I mentioned a, a little earlier, um, which is a, a um, joint venture between, uh, uh, project venture between MPI and Red Stag. Um, there's Woodworks, um, who've done a lot of good work over the years. There's Wood Solutions in Australia. Uh, and think wood in USA. And there are others, including Trata in the UK and, and various others, but they're probably the key, the key ones that um, have similar purposes in life, if you like. So I'm going to 
stop shortly. I've given you an stop speaking shortly. Well, I've given you just an introduction um, to the Timber Design Centre um, and why we've come about and what we hope to do and achieve. Um, but I guess it's important to make it clear to you that we are still very much in a formative stage. And um, you know, any feedback or comments or suggestions that you might have for the TDC, apart from any feedback um, you might have strictly today, but um, down the track um, in the coming days or weeks, um, please don't be backwards in coming forward. Um, there's my cell phone number there, uh, my current email address, and there's also a possibility of providing feedback on the uh, current website, which is um, put there for you on that slide. Um, you know, we are, we are certainly open to um, any commentary about what things you think could or should be done that would help advance the cause of more timber in the built environment in future, more engineered timber in the built environment. So, yeah, please, um, if you think of stuff, be in touch, please. Um, a concluding couple of thoughts, um, which I'd just like to share with you. Um, the first one is actually uh, something from the Warren and Marnie Advanced Timber Unit. And it goes like this, by 2030, uh, our goal with clients is that all new projects designed by Warren and Marnie will be net zero carbon in operation, be 50% more energy efficient and have 40% less embodied carbon. And the increased use of mass timber is central to achieving these targets. And from a very recent uh, published, uh, article published in Nature Communications called uh, entitled Land Use Change and Carbon Emissions of, um, of a Transformation to Timber Cities, um, I just picked a couple of things uh, out of that paper. Uh, it's a whole lot of modelling, but it's a very interesting read, actually. And the ones I've put there for you, uh, if 90% if of new urban population uh, would be housed in newly built urban mid-rise buildings with wooden constructions, 106 gigatons of additional carbon dioxide could be saved by 2100. And to, to meet that, if it was to happen, um, forest plantations, this is on a global scale, forest plantations would need to expand uh, by up to 149 million hectares by 2100. And then I guess importantly, um, uh, uh, following on from that is, was the statement which came through their modelling or as a result of their modelling that um, the results of that indicate that expansion of um, timber plantations for wooden buildings is possible without major repercussions on agricultural production. So I just thought there was some, some fairly powerful things there and they relate um, uh, very um, pointedly to what um, we are trying to do, um, and I guess are supportive of that. So, um, with those couple of concluding thoughts, um, my intention now is to stop speaking um, and perhaps um, hand back to Namir Namir or who it might be. Thank you, Robert, for this presentation. It, it's it's very exciting. It's it's definitely the right moment. Uh, for timber in New Zealand and around the globe. Um, and it, it's really great to see this, this uh, happening all together. So I'm, I'm Daniel Roder, I'm the president of the Timber Design Society, and we are part of the Timber Design Centre in terms of we are one of the four funding, uh, founding members uh, who applied for the funding from MPI. I always have a big interest of this centre going ahead and delivering to the wider goods in, in terms of timber design in New Zealand. Um, before we go into the question uh, session as well, um, I also would like to uh, thank Rotoblast in terms of our sponsors. They recently joined um, us as a sponsor as well. Uh, we are a group of volunteers um, trying to do as much as we can in terms of, of timber design. And that's where we're excited to have Robert and his team um, having a, a full-time role essentially helping us achieving this as well. And we will continue working with Robert and his team and the other funding, founding members to, to achieve that, obviously. Another thing, uh, I also would like all of you to have a look at the ITP, the Industry Transformation Plan. Uh, Bernie put in the, the link to this. 
It is very exciting. It's it's a very ambitious vision, but I think it is achievable and it really going to make a difference uh, in terms of the New Zealand construction sector and forestry sector and wood processing sector. The other thing, uh, Robert will also join us in part at least for the timber design roadshow, which is coming up mid-October, where we introduced the new timber design standard. So it will be also an occasion to, you know, talk to Robert face to face and, uh, and ask him questions if you want to. The other thing uh, Robert might have alluded to, he will be um, at the New Zealand Field Days in Hamilton as well. Um, right. Um, we have a few questions, not that many, so please pop them in uh, if you have any questions. Um, Robert, I'm going to read them out to you and then you can... Uh, uh, address them, and uh, if I can, I might I might help as well. So we have a question from Joel Natley from Waka Kodahi. Thank you, Joel. Um, he's asking um, that in your presentation, you put a lot of focus on the uh, carbon benefits related in, to engineered timber construction. And he's wondering if there's also other, uh, or if it would be helpful to invoke broader range of benefits um, to bring the industry, the government, and society on the, on this journey with us. And he's referring to, say, aesthetics, waste reduction, benefits to New Zealand incorporation, like New Zealand products, a reduced footprint on the environment, um, alignment with Teo Maori, seismic resilience, and others. So I think he's covering a lot of a lot of these topics already. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on the the additional benefits um, when specifying and building in timber? Yes. Look, thanks very much for the question. Um, it is a very good one. And in terms of um, broader benefits, let's say, for the New Zealand economy, um, yes, I think there are a number. Um, and not, not least of which, probably one of the most important ones um, would be, in my mind, when, when this gets some momentum and the, um, the requirement for um, greater volumes of engineered timber um, becomes really obvious, then I think um, the benefit of uh, the, the, the benefits to, let's say, increased future regional employment, um, both in, in not just in the forestry sector, but in the, in the um, products manufacturing sector will be, will be good. And this will have some good um, spin-off outcomes for, for for the economy um, in relation to to, to, to regional benefit uh, re regional employment. So I think that's one of the additional things. Um, look, uh, there, there are there are a plethora of of possible uh, or likely um, other benefits, and you've actually mentioned quite a few of them just there in your question. Um, and there's, there's no doubt that the opportunity to um, reduce waste, um, reduce construction times, reduce construction costs, um, and so on, um, are definitely real benefits um, when it comes to uh, using tim mass timber in, in, um, in construction in this way. So, look, I think it's very broad ranging. Um, I'm actually just really excited about the possibility for um, some re some regional areas of New Zealand to actually be able to get fully engaged in um, in this movement for um, supply uh, to meet the, the anticipated demand as as it ramps up. Thank you, Robert. Um, and I fully agree that there's a lot of different reasons, and I think it needs a bit of time for everyone to pick up on those, and it needs some who are taking the lead. And um, uh, it is happening, and that, that's really good news. Um, I have another question here from, from David Carradine. Thank you, David. Um, his question is, do you see an opportunity for the Timber Design Center to collaborate with uh, HERA on the recently announced successful 1 million, uh, sorry, 10 million MB funding aimed to transform the construction industry? What, what are your thoughts on, on a potential collaboration with HERA, for instance? Um. I, I'm not aware of the details of, of the recent um, funding that Hera might have received. Uh, I just don't know about those details. But if I can just turn that into a, a more general answer about collaboration, goodness, we, I mean, we're open to collaboration with anyone, um, whether it's you know, Steel Construction New Zealand, Hera, um, Concrete NZ. Um, 
I, I don't mind. Um, and in fact, what we're seeking is you know, best possible outcomes for clients and developers around the country um, with minimal possible, uh, with minimum um, uh, effects uh, in the future on, on, on the climate. So um, in any way that we can work together with any of the, or either of the other two major materials, um, the door will be totally open and um, we will be genuine in our, in our desire to collaborate. Yeah, I, I fully second that any collaboration with other organizations or like-minded people is, is obviously uh, definitely of, of, of benefit. There's another question in terms of what, what the focus of the research center will be. Will it be only timber? And how will it be different from brands, for instance? Um, unashamedly, the focus will only be timber. Um, not necessarily just engineered timber product, um, but timber in all its forms. But um, it's reasonable to assume that we'll spend more focus on engineered timber than we will on others, simply because of its application to those parts of the of the uh, built environment um, where we think the biggest opportunity is to get more timber into the built environment. Um, so. It will be unashamedly all about timber. Um, do we want, would we um, see an opportunity to collaborate with brands? Totally. Um, the thing you must remember about brands is um, brands is, is um, material agnostic and that's how they are and that's how they need to be. Um, we um, are clearly focused on um, finding ways to make greater use of timber. But that said, I mean, brands are a very important supporting collaborating part of, partner of the Timber Design Centre. Um, and there's a very simple and good reason for that. Um, uh, and it's part of their, um, their objectives, which is to um, lower carbon emissions in the, in the building and construction um, uh, in, uh, industry. So um, one way to, for them to uh, achieve some of their goals is to work very closely with us. Thanks, Robert. Um, there's a, a, a comment and a question from Anne. Uh, first of all, she's thanking you, Robert, for the excellent presentation, which I, I fully second. Thanks, Robert. Um, and the question is, do you think more supplies of CLP and engineered timber using New Zealand timber will be required in New Zealand? Um, the short, the long answer is yes, and the really short answer is yep. <laughs> um, uh, I think the ITP uh, also is, is answering this um, in terms of the supply of, of, of raw timber has been increasing over the last 10, 20 years, but the wood processing capability has been quite stagnant, stagnant over the last years. And I think it needs a lot more. And also the, um, the last, oh, it's actually up. I think it was the last, sorry, the last uh, journal, TDS journal has an article from Andy Buchanan doing a bit of an analysis on that. And I think it, it requires a multiple of the current capacity in New Zealand. So yes, I think it is a, a very strong yes. We need to upskill and upgrade um, the sector. Otherwise we can actually not supply all the timber we need for construction in, in New Zealand in the next years. And just adding to that, um... Daniel, look, there, there has been some investment in the very recent um, past, as most will be aware. Um, and, you know, I, I acknowledge the fact that um, investment in capacity um, comes with risk. And so the question then is, well, please demonstrate to me that the market opportunity is there. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, but I think... Um, there is enough entrepreneurial spirit in this country to recognise, you know, to see these mega trends, see the force, see what's coming, uh, and be willing to take some risk to um, early on to actually invest further, because there will be a need for significant more investment in um, in in the supply chain. And, and again, the, the ITP addresses this and and will help any potential investors or current suppliers to invest further into this capability. Yeah. Um, another question uh, we got here is, is a bit more technical, so let's see how we go. Apart from the timber being naturally sourced from the tree growth, 
How sustainable are epoxy resins used for the products such as glue lamp or LVL? And does laminated timber have a larger CO2 footprint when compared with structural grade natural timber? Do you, can you are you able to answer this question, Robert? Perhaps not in a in a really concise, meaningful way. Um, they're very that's a very specific couple of questions. Um, and I guess it depends on exactly what he, adhesives we're, we're talking about. Um, I don't know, maybe you can, you've got something, some light you can shine on that, Daniel, just, uh, just in, in quick response. Um, I'm, I'm not very, very familiar with all the specifics, but there are sufficient EDPs so, or um, environmental product declaration documents of the different suppliers in New Zealand, which compare the different wood products on an international level amongst each other and with other material, materials as well. So natural timber obviously doesn't have much processing, so there's less carbon footprint, whereas some engineered wood products need, um, because of the additional processing, have a slightly bigger impact from kiln drying to the manufacturing process to the glues itself. But in the scheme of things, there's only a very small percentage of, of the different glues in it. And also those glues have a relatively small carbon footprint. So yes, there's a small difference among those different products, but compared to uh, say the, the traditional concrete steel and other products, it, it is it much, much better off still. But um, for the specifics, um, I invite you to have a look at the um, uh, NZ Wood guideline about sustainability and about the, the various uh, ADP, the product declarations of the various suppliers as well. Thanks. Another question here from Michael is, um, uh, will the TDC be able to offer construct constructability review or advice on buildability? Yeah, nice question. Um, and I guess that goes to the heart of some of the discussion that the governance group was having this morning. Um, and look, I, I can't give you a, a definitive answer to that right now. Um, but it is my hope that um, we will be able to provide that sort of level of assistance um, in the, in, in certainly to, at least towards the end of the establishment period, which is towards the middle of next year. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. There's another very specific questions, um, which probably I can answer. <laughs> I start. Uh, what software are there for timber design with New Zealand standards similar to ETAPS? So, Go should, on, should I? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can, but I, you, you do it. You're, you're doing it every day. Yeah. So, I don't think there's any specific software I've written for New Zealand standards as yet, and also not much really specific for timber. So, there's a, there's a wide range of, of product, uh, of software packages out there. Uh, in specific, we use RFM uh, from Lubal out of Europe. They do have a normal finite element module, and then they have add-ons for timber, but it's not specific for timber, and, and I don't think there will be any soon. Um, I think all the software packages can be used for the analysis, but then the actual design needs to be done by the engineer itself. There are some products out of Italy which have to be transferred to Australian standards, um, which could be used, but they're still in this infancy. And the other thing to consider, the current New Zealand standards for 603 um, will be superseded in the very, very near future. So as of next month, we will have a new timber design standard. And uh, it will take some time for software houses to pick up on this and provide specific uh, software. So it's a new type engineering, perhaps, in terms of mass timber in New Zealand. So uh, I think for now, we need to use what we have. There is, however, sufficient guidance available. For instance, FP Innovation has, as of last month, um, published a 700 pages guideline on timber modeling, which uh, is freely available. So have a look at this and provide, it probably provides a lot of the answers you, you're probably after. Right, there's another comment from uh, another attendee saying that WPMA has some of the EPDs. Uh, referring to solid and engineered wood products, so another source where the sustainability information can be um, sold after. Right, another question for you, Robert. Um, 
from a whole life and body carbon perspective, does the TDC have any ambitions to investigate the re reusability, recyclability of timber products and the impact timber products might have on the development of a more circular economy in the construction industry? Fantastic question. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, in fact, this very point is actually quite dear to my heart. Um, and I can assure you, I'll be doing everything in my capacity to ensure that some of the resource and finance that Timber Design Centre will have will actually go towards uh, further investigation of this because um, it's, it's an important question. Um, I mean, we, we have a, uh, a building code that essentially def um, arbit almost arbitrarily defines building a building to be at the end of life after 50 years. Um, and then the current, you know, the current position in New Zealand is that we deconstruct the thing and put it in landfill. Um, and that's politically on the nose. Um, there are big questions about, big, big broad questions about how much treatment we do, why we do it. Um, what else can we do with it at the so-called end? I mean, the first thing is um, it probably is good for way more than 50 years. It could be 100 years, could be 200 years. But irrespective of, of that, um, deconstruct, reuse, repurpose, deconstruct, um, remachine and, and turn into other things, deconstruct and use as a, as a pelletized fuel source um, or use the fibre source for other um, bio applications, uh, which will come on stream in time. I think these are all really important aspects that relate to that end of life um, and what the possibilities might be in the future. What I would encourage people not to get hung up on is to think too hard about what our current situation is, because let's face it, in you know anything that you that you design and build now. Um, whatever technologies we have in 50 years for dealing with the so-called end of life, they will be very different to now. So it's not something we should get hung up on now. But that said, it's something that I really, really do want and will um, do everything I can to make sure that the Timber Design Centre actually um, investigates the, the, the future possibilities um, as broad as they are. Yeah. Thank you, Robert, and, and uh, you definitely have our support on that because this is one of the outstanding questions which we, we should answer in the, in the near future. Yes. Robert, um, last question um, here from Craig is, um, how are the expected future demand, timber demand versus current supply versus export demand? Uh, I think the ITP has a bit of a guesstimate or estimate on this one. Can you perhaps quickly summarize for us? Um, yeah, look, future demand, um, if we're doing our job properly, will, um, will rise and rise dramatically. Um, the ability for supply to keep up with that is the open question, um, uh, and we touched on that before. Um, at the moment, it, we do export a lot of the fibre in the form of so-called low-grade lobs. Um, there's something like I think nearly 60% of them go across the wharf uh, as a log. Um, we have to get to the position, I believe, where um, that volume going across the wharf as a log is considerably reduced. Um, and we've uh, put in place the technologies and the investments uh, and the processes for um, turning that, the, even that current source into um, greater domestic supply, um, you know, and that's that is borne out as a as a very real desire in the industry transformation plan uh, as well. So, um, you know, just exactly how the dynamics of investment um, versus demand will turn out, I guess, is anyone's guess. But um, there is no doubt that the general directions should be clear. The demand domestically will increase. Um, we will need to do more with the current. Um, resource base and and export less of it as a as a log in time. Awesome, thank you, Robert. And now before we let everyone go back to to work or, or lunch, um, you did mention recruitment. Um, 
do you want to um, explore this here quickly with, with the attendees? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, look, I'll just take a, a few moments. But um, very recently, uh, we advertised to an attempt to, to attract um, a technical manager for the Timber Design Centre, and uh, it was spectacularly unsuccessful, I have to say to you. Um, and so I, I guess, given the opportunity now, I'm just putting a plea out there um, we, I'm looking for someone who um, does know their way around the New Zealand building code, the relevant standards, um, uh, preferably would have had some experience in um, design and specification of, of, of timber buildings and out structural elements and so on in the past, um, or any of the above. Um, the, I'm now so desperate, it could be part-time, it could be full-time, um, uh, it could be on a contract basis, um, it could be on a secondment basis, but um, Look, to, to create good outcomes in a timely fashion, um, I need more help. So um, if you uh, know of or think of uh, anyone who might have been uh, interested in um, participating, who has a, a, an appropriate technical background, um, please be in touch with me or, or through Daniel, if you like, because I mean, Daniel is the TDS representative on the governance group um, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll be delighted to hear of, of any possibilities, please. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. And yes, of course, uh, get in touch either with Robert or myself to Engineer New Zealand or directly. Um, we're looking for some, yeah, capable people, um, passionate in timber um, to, make, to make this point of difference. Right, I think um, that is it for today. Robert, thank you again for making time and for your presentation and, and looking forward to the next months of, of working with you and, and the rest of the team. And obviously the uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand design community and, and construction community. Thanks thank everyone for listening. Um, uh, Bernie and Namir also for hosting and, and organizing all of that. And I wish everyone a good afternoon. And